Hello and welcome. I am not Justin. And I'm definitely not Yuri. I'm Eric Scholes. I'm a solutions architect with AWS. And I'm Nick McCarthy. I'm a ProServe consultant with AWS. And this is episode four of five. Yeah, of our Building Secure App series. Uh, this week's episode is titled, The Code is Not Static, App Care. Yeah, so don't change that channel because this is exactly what it is that you're looking for. Just different people today. That's right. Um, last week, Justin and Yuri talked about, in episode three, they talked about um, securing applications in terms of things like uh, vulnerabilities, uh, SQL injection, cross-site scripting. Um, That's right, yeah. And they had a question that came in about cross-site scripting. Uh, the yeah. question was, if my website is already vulnerable to cross-site scripting, is there a chance that my user's cookies could be stolen? And the answer is, yeah. At that point, if you're already vulnerable, there's a chance that the cookies can be taken. So the steps to look at are to look at the OWASP cheat sheet on cross-site scripting prevention. And let's, and let's show them that, too. Yeah. Pull that up. I've got it pulled up here. So there's a whole bunch of prevention rules. Basically, it comes down to you need to escape your user input. You don't want your users to input code that ends up being executed by your browser and get run as JavaScript, for example. So there's a whole bunch of rules on what to escape, where to escape it, and you can also make use of like object relation mapping when you're taking your data and putting it into a database and reading it back so you don't have those kind of SQL injections as well. So in addition to these prevention rules, there's also a couple of really good bonuses. One is using HTTP-only cookie flags. This is a really cool new kind of cookie that your browser will accept, but it will not pass on to the DOM so it can't be exploited through JavaScript. Uh, and uh, JL97, that was your question. I hope that gives you the answer that you were looking for. And a reminder, we're here on Twitch, and this is a two-way conversation, so please use the Twitch channel to ask questions, and our gentleman in the lounge will be taking those questions and either answering them or sending them back to us. So with that, let me introduce who we have in the lounge today. Hi, I'm still Ted. I'm still an AWS Solutions Architect, and I'm still here. And I'm Dominic Catalano, Solutions Architect with AWS, also here to answer questions. Over to you. Perfect. Now, you know, it's interesting. That question um, is a great question, and there's what we're actually going to talk about today really helps in validating some of the things that JL asked, actually, mm -hmm. um, before we get too far. And so we're going to talk about DevOps today. That's right. Um, uh, DevSecOps, actually, to be exact. Yeah, yeah, we're going to look at how CI/CD works and then how we can bring security into that CI/CD pipeline. So, CI/CD, continuous integration and continuous delivery or continuous deployment. So, it's both. And what, wait, what's the difference there? I'm glad you asked. I was hoping you would. Um, continuous delivery is the ability to iterate over code very quickly and okay. deliver that code uh, as fast as possible based on requirements, agile scrum stories, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Uh, continuous deployment is a bit different. That's actually the ability to move that code base from one environment to another, usually through automation, all the way to production. And I know that scares most people. They hear, oh my gosh, automate all the way to production. That can't be done. Yeah, no, that takes entire teams. Typically. I, and I can tell you, look, I, back in, we'll call it the olden days, back in the olden times, um, I remember where a lot of times you had dev teams that wrote mm -hmm. code, yep. and you had a separate siloed team that operated. That's they right. operated the infrastructure, an operations team might be uh, a dotted line to the development team of that product, and developers would just throw the code over the fence to the ops team. Don't do that. That's, that's not the way we do it anymore. Um, well, it's not, it can be the way you do it, but it's not the most effective way to do it. Right. But on the other hand, with that, you had a uh, process, so uh, security could be developed and, and looked at by a security team. The only downside there is when your developer needs a port open, it takes a week or two. At least. Yeah. You usually have to cut a ticket, security team has to pick up the ticket, validate it, go through the justifications, then they have to coordinate, coordinate with potentially the network team or whoever else to actually open the ports. Yeah, that's all, that's all a, a, a very manual, bureaucratic way of doing things. Um, so DevOps, is, it's really a philosophy and cultural change. It's, it's moving the security aspect, the, uh, the infrastructure aspect, and the software aspect all into one big infrastructure as code. Right? Yeah, so what kind of applications or things can we bring into DevOps and CICD pipelines? Um, there really is no limit. Uh, if you have an application that's a web, let's say you have a web application, that qualifies. If you have okay. application code that is maybe even batch processing, that qualifies. Event-driven code, such as Lambda code, that qualifies. In fact, even um, infrastructure as code, CloudFormation, Terraform templates, whatever they may be, 
all of that code qualifies as well. And all of that should be under, to start off with, under a repository, right? That's right, yeah. So help me understand, or help everybody else understand, what do we gain from code being in a repository? Yeah, so code being in a repository means that when uh, you had a bad night and you went through your code and deleted all these functions that you thought you weren't using, and you weren't, but uh, turns out that Eric was using, mm. uh, you don't waste his last three weeks of work. Um, everyone can take their code, push it into a repository, and we have a nice audit trail of all the code that was pushed, People can work on the same project at the same time. The, the code can be merged together and it can uh, be tracked and stored easily. In addition, using a uh, uh, Git repository on uh, AWS service like CodeCommit gives you the backing of S3 behind it where you know, your code has that uh, you know, secure and it's backed up in multiple places. 11 nines of durability. 11 nines, yeah. that's a lot. Pretty impressive. Okay, so when we move from the idea of committing code into a repo, you also then think about, well, okay, that's the first part of CI, CD, but, but, but why CI, CD? What is that going to give me? So I can create a pipeline that's going to do integration of the code change, mm -hmm. uh, integration with tests, right. um, a deployment maybe to a lower environment, and then potentially maybe approvals and then deployment, deployment to a production environment. Yeah, you can, you can script out that entire process, whatever your business flow needs to be, whether it's, you know, uh, one man team and you just want to make sure you go through a few checks yourself or where it's a you know large software company where you've got multiple processes that need to be all part of this pipeline you can you can integrate and script together as, uh, are there a lot of common tools or is there one tool for every job or what do we got here uh, there's a there's a whole lot of tools we've got Jenkins right I do remember Jenkins yep Jenkins is there we've got Travis CI Travis CI is another good one uh, we just looked it up there is just about every word with the letter CI after it and and there's a there's a build in CI tool for it there is there is and and so it, really the idea here when you think about CI CD and you think about DevSecOps it's not it isn't really the tool set that's there okay it's it's you know the difference between a sledgehammer and a little tiny hammer is the size nail you drive but they both look like hammers not every tool is right for everything but what you can look at is Picking the tool that is right for the job based on the requirements of your job and what the feature sets are of the tool that's there. So go forth and look at all of them and play with them. See which one's going to work best for you. Uh, today we're going to do some demoing. That's good. Yeah, absolutely. And we're going to be demoing, though, however, and, and mainly what? We're going to be demoing using some AWS services. So we're going to be looking at Code Pipeline, and it's going to integrate in with a few other services. It's got Code Build, uh, which will be able to build, for example, if you have code that needs to be compiled, it can go through those compilation steps. Um, if you have shell scripts that need to be run, it can go run those for you. And then we also have uh, Code Deploy, which will push your code out to AWS services. And then finally, we already talked about Code Commit, which is uh, our version of a Git repository. Very good. Um, so testing. Testing in, is in there as well. Um, we showed the OWASP page earlier, which talks about different types of frameworks that are out there, or different types of things that you can test with. Um, we're also going to have a demo that talks about how we can do some of that testing. Um, Let's move into then, let's talk about that exactly. Um, testing functionality. Yeah, what, what kind of things would we want to test for? Well, I mean, the, 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 the cross-side scripting was probably, that was a great one. Yeah, yeah. so is that something that, do we need to deploy it? Does it need to be running for us to test that? Are there different kinds of tests? You mean like in production? Well, in production or dev, uh, there's there's probably tests we can run before, uh, before we've even put our code uh, Explain that to me. Running. Yeah, so there's uh, static analysis, right? So we can actually take our source code and just have certain tools that look through that source code that know bad source code patterns, that know certain vulnerabilities that exist in your source code, and they can flag you before we even stand up resources and put that code on those resources. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. So will, are, there, are there test suites or test tooling then that even before you deploy, can they do things like find CVEs that exist? Yeah, yeah, there's a, there's a whole bunch of different tools. Um, we'll link this in the show notes as well. Um, OWASP, again, is an excellent resource on all things application development. They have an entire page on what static code analysis is, and um, part of this page is they jump into a whole bunch of different tools. So there's open source tools for just about every language out there. There's also a whole bunch of commercial tools. Some of these are even from our uh, AWS partners that are able to integrate in with a, a code pipeline, and you can, uh, you can do testing. Very good. We have, um, I think we have a blog post that we can show them as well that shows you what a pipeline looks like. Yeah. Right? From the, from the bare bones of what a pipeline looks like. Can we show them that one? Yeah. Here's a really basic uh, code deploy pipeline. 
And so in this, here I'll scroll down a little bit so we can see more. So we've got a source stage, and in this case, our source is either going to be an Amazon S3 bucket or AWS code commit repository. Now, uh, Code Pipelines actually has the ability to take more sources. So if you've got code on GitHub, we can integrate in with GitHub as well. We can use a webhook, so every time you push code to GitHub, it'll uh, kick off an event that will start this pipeline. And from this uh, source stage, we'll go into a deploy stage. So uh, the pipeline is using code deploy, and it's standing up EC2 instances with the code. So once you've gone to beta, we'll probably have either a testing step in between here, or it could be a manual approval yeah. step. And at that point, if everything's good, you can click a button, push it off to production, and have it automatically tear down those uh, beta resources. So back in the uh, back in the day, I had a uh, we had a, a large pipeline that was using Jenkins and a couple of other tool sets. Mm -hmm. And on uh, Amazon, I had bought a about a twenty inch tall um, stoplight traffic awesome. light. Okay. Um, and wired it to work with the Jenkins build for the, and, and actually would change the color of the lights based on whether or not a build failed. The build failed, the light would be red. If the build passed, the light would be green. If there was a build currently running, the yellow light would blink and you would have the, rem the, the remaining state of whatever the last build status was, red or green, while the, red, while the yellow light was blinking. Um, that was great, it caught everyone's attention. It helped us understand um, who would receive the bobblehead award. The, the what? The bobblehead award. So, uh, you know, there's, a, there's a one thing that developers love, I would typically say, and I, I speak on behalf of all of you, of course, is that th there's, a, there's always a healthy competition of who writes the prettiest code, who writes the best code, who writes the code that doesn't break the most. So when you have a team of developers all working in, and they're, they're committing code, they're merging their code, it's kicking off the pipeline, it's doing the build, we would have a bobblehead award for if you were unfortunate enough to break the build. Ooh. So the light would go red, Everybody knew the build was broken. Everybody would jump in to see what broke and who committed the last commit to break. And then the bobblehead, it was a uh, Vetchkin bobblehead, would make its way onto your desk for, for showmanship until such time that somebody else broke the build. I, I imagine that bobblehead spent a lot of time on your desk. Let's move on. <laughs> okay. Let's move on. <laughs> Let's um, move on here. It went from a friendly conversation to this. Um, so yeah, so the types of code again, infrastructure as code, and that's one of the biggest ones that we're going to talk about today is infrastructure as code because with DevOps and DevSecOps, it isn't just that software developers are just writing their app code anymore. They're, they're, whether, it's, whether it's containerization, where they're saying what the resources are in the container or the Docker file, the file that they require, or whether it's saying I need uh, an auto-scaling group of three instances behind uh, an ELB, right, for my yeah. web app. Absolutely. Hey, I think we've got a question. You want to go to it? Absolutely. Yes, so our question comes from Matt Sunnell. He was asking, can you talk about how j you can have a Java app talking to a database hosted on Git can be deployed to ECS through CICD? Don't know if you have to answer that right now or just kind of talk about that a little later on. Yeah, let's, let, me, um, I, let, me, let me repeat it real quick, make sure I understood it. A Java app hosted on Git yeah. talking to an Oracle database Talking to a database. Oh, talking, talking to a database that is uh, going to, as a container? Yes, they want it to be deployed on ECS. Deployed on ECS? Through CICD. So how to set up that relationship. Okay, we can, I think we can touch on that, and if we run out of time, we can definitely put information into the, at, at the end of the, uh, the chat, or we can have it covered in the beginning of next time. So we'll, we'll definitely see if we can cover that. And, and Matt, as we're going through some of the steps, you might see, and we'll talk to as we do some of the demos, hey, this is where you could have created a Docker file and moved this in and changed them something to become, uh, instead of an EC2 instance, something in, uh, from the ECR repository and then de deploy to a container. So we can definitely talk about that. Yeah, um, absolutely. So where we were talking about was now taking the CI CD and uh, bringing the testing into it. You're talking about testing for infrastructure as code, right? Infrastructure as code, yeah. So. And so we can actually do tests on that in our pipeline. We can. There's a bunch of different tools, as usual, that you can use here. There's, um, and I think we have an example that we can go through. Um, in fact, first we have a solution that was built that we can show you, and we'll go ahead and put this link in the chat as well. Yeah, so this is a tool from our AWS Solutions Builder team, and I'm just quickly showing you the, um, the diagram for this. Um, this is a code pipeline that starts with your source being in code commit, and it goes through a series of pre-create tests. These tests all fire off Lambda functions. And for example, one of them is CFN NAG. This will look at an incoming CloudFormation template, and it's going to do verification on your CloudFormation template. It can verify that the template is valid syntax. You can also do testing to say, 
you know, if, if this CloudFormation template has uh, open security groups, let's say you've got port 22 open to the world. Is, um, that, is that bad? Well, it depends. Do you, do you like lots of SSH traffic from unknown users? No, I don't think I do. Okay, yeah, that's bad. Okay. It's bad. So CFN NAG is one of these really cool tools out there that's specific to CloudFormation templates. Um, it's going to be kicked off by this Lambda function, and it's running in, in code build to look at that CloudFormation template, and it's going to report back. It's either going to give you a pass, or it's going to give you a fail, and that fail is going to tell you what's wrong with your template. So you could use this, again, for security violations, for syntax errors. You could even use it for style guides. So the team I'm on actually has our own version of this where we have a specific code style that we want to enforce. And to enforce that code style, we have a very similar process built with code pipelines where we'll submit code to a shared repository. And as soon as we do a commit, a few seconds later, we get an email back saying if we passed or failed, we've got all the style guide rules, and it'll say, you failed this rule because you forgot to do so and so. And that's a great reminder. It's really quick to go in there and fix and recommit. <coughs> and so let's be clear, as it, it, we're not saying that developers in the DevSecOps world need to become InfoSec, or that developers need to become infrastructure managers all the way through and through. <coughs> But now they have the ability to create what they know that they need to run their applications in terms of the size, the count, what the scaling group may look like, right? And then what InfoSec has dictated the standards should be. So right. the idea here is you go through and write your to, you write to the standard that InfoSec has, has stated, and then the tool sets actually just validate whether or not you're meeting the standard. Yeah, exactly. So security controls can be part of the deployment pipeline now. We don't have to go and check hey, uh, let's go see this uh, tool you deployed. Let's see if it meets all of our requirements. We can have those requirements uh, enforced right up front, which is great because then you don't have to deploy resources. You don't have potentially vulnerable resources sitting out there before your security team gets around to reviewing them. That's right. And so many times applications can make it to production and then only later during an audit, whether it's a NIST 853 audit, whether it's some other sort of, a sort of compliance audit, only then is it sometimes found that oh my gosh, you have a security group open, or you have this open, or this shouldn't have been the case, and you, have, you don't have least privilege on the IAM roles, right. this is a problem. It's better to know that well up front and meet those security controls and, and not hinder the pipeline going Yeah, forward. exactly. And, and like Yuri and Justin talked about last week, they were looking at the OWASP top 10 list. Uh, in your company, you're going to go through and you're going to come up with the security controls you need in place. You're going to turn those into user stories, and then from those user stories, you can start to build those controls into this CI/CD pipeline. Uh, to be able to have that security up front in your now DevSecOps pipeline. Right. So what we showed you there in the architecture is, is one way to do it. It's not the only way. There's about a million ways to skin this cat. So yep. let's go and show, um, let's jump into the demo. Sure. One cool thing I'll, I'll talk about this pipeline really quick is that this is something <coughs> you can go deploy in your environment right now. There's a right. deployment guide, and you can just launch the solution via CloudFormation template. So that's really cool. You have a demo you want us to jump into, right? Yeah, let's jump into your demo. We're, we're here we're gonna we're gonna show you a very small short pipeline in real time, um, and this is actually going to do uh, some security code analysis, right? This is going to that's right. This is going to you're gonna commit some code. It's gonna look up things that it thinks may not be great, and I think what's the tool set that we're using for this one today? Yeah, so let me refresh and I'll jump in here. So I wrote a, a lambda function and um, it's just Python code, and I want to make sure that. My Python code passes uh, compliance checks before I uh, go ahead and deploy it to Lambda. Um, and so what I've done is I have uh, opened up my pipeline here. I've already set up my pipeline. It's got a source, and in my case, this source is a code commit repository. Um, and then I've got a test process, and you can see I last tested an hour ago. I failed. Oh, man. Yeah. Um, and uh, when it does work, it'll That's deploy right. to S3. Do we have a bobblehead? I, no bobblehead okay. here. <clears throat> So um, this was about an hour ago. I'm going to go ahead and just click on this again. I haven't changed any code. Release change will just take so the very last commit and try to. Here. Yep, it'll try to run the pipeline again, which I predict will have a similar outcome. It should. And so very quickly, what's happening in the background here is that uh, um, code pipeline is taking my code, it's packaging it into a secure S3 bucket, and then it's passing it through the pipeline. So you can see we're now in the test stage. The test stage is happening in AWS Code Build. And code build is our tool that can be used to build code. Um, we were just talking about how to um, use code pipeline for a Java application. Code build is where you would actually uh, take your Java application and you'd send it through that comp compilation step using something like Maven, for example. Um, so I've got code build running right now. Code build, in my case, it's running um, a Python tool. And what's that called again? 
I'm sorry. Uh, the Python. Oh, Bandit. Bandit. Yes. And Bandit is a uh, aesthetic code analysis tool. So it's going through my Python code. It's looking for a bunch of best practices. If I'm violating any of those best practices, it's going to fail on me. Um, and, and again, there's multiple tool sets we could have chosen. This is just one of the many tools that exists on OWASP or any of the other sites. It talks yep. about. There's a whole bunch of tools, moment. and a lot of them also have the ability to write your own uh, extensions or plugins. Yep. So you can test for you know things that are very unique to your specific business logic. And that was a good point that you made earlier about the, the standards that the team puts in. The standards that the team puts in are absolutely great because you want you want code to, to be maintainable for the, the team behind yeah, you as well as... It failed again. Oh my gosh. Well, let's take a look. Do we understand why it failed? Yeah, so uh, last time it failed, I actually looked at the logs. It writes logs out inside of code build. I'll just pop into that really quick. Um, and I can look at the execution details here inside of code build. And real quick, when we look at this, what is, what's Code Build doing in the background? I mean, it's obviously going to run Bandit, which isn't an AWS thing. That's just an open source tool that we use. But what's happening on the back end here? Yeah, so the, the infrastructure behind this is that uh, Code Build is a managed service that deploys a container, um, container of your choice. I'm using uh, the default uh, managed container for Code Build. You can also pick your own Docker container. So if you have very specific yep. build processes, you can pick your container. That touches a little bit on Matt Neal's question as well. Uh, back to the fact that you could have a Docker container for the code that you that you have, that you have in the repository. You'd have an AMI probably, uh, a pre-built AMI for your Oracle database potentially, and then you could use CI/CD to launch the Docker container, launch the AMI for the database, perform all your do the testing, use uh, a, a template, um, CloudFormation template, do all the networking, the VPC, the subnet setup, and everything else, and completely deploy the entire entire application. Yeah, absolutely. In my case, uh, I had the test results written out to a JSON file on an S3 bucket. So let me jump over there. I already opened it. And we can see it's a JSON output. And here's the results. And Ooh. it looks like, oh. So somebody wrote some code using the request module, and they included verify equals false, which effectively disables SSL security checking, which means we could be that's well, outside of best practices. Mill attacks. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of. I wonder who wrote this code. Uh, let's see. Here. What line oh, is it? It's this line right here, code by Nick. Must have been a different Nick. Uh, yeah, different Nick. We need to hire another Nick. <laughs> we, we're on it. Okay, so I'm gonna really quickly go through and fix my code. So now all you've done here in that fix is go ahead and got rid of the verify equals false. Yes. Yeah, so now I have a request that is gonna enforce SSL. And now I'm in the uh, directory of my repository. I'm going to do a git, and I'm just going to add this file. This is my Lambda function. You did that well. Thank you. You must have done this before. I've used git once. OK, good. And I add it. And now I'm going to go ahead and recommit this. And I'm going to say, fix my SSL vulnerability. That's that. And I'll push it back up to the repo. So when you push it to the repo, what's happening now? So it's. Um, basically taking a, a delta and it's just writing the bits that have changed, pushing them to uh, code commit. And now code commit is gonna receive that, store it securely. And if I jump into my pipeline, uh, my pipeline is actually gonna get a CloudWatch event that is gonna be kicked off from uh, the new commit. Oh, there it is, just now, source fixed SSL vulnerability. So the, the events coming from through CloudWatch are near real time. That's right, yeah much within a few seconds of making a new commit as soon as that code gets up there and it's been checked in there's some eventual consistency a CloudWatch event will fire off and uh, your code pipeline will start running so we're running through the pipeline again um, we could keep on doing this over and over again as many deployments as we had um, I think while it's uh, checking here running? we've got another question let's go to the lounge yeah so we have a question from Dan Quixote sorry if I missed it but are you also using anything for dependency vulnerability checking, like SNCC? Any suggestions on open source options for that? So in, in today's discussions, we're, we don't have that in there today. Today is looking at most of the vulnerabilities, not necessarily dependency um, vulnerabilities. But that doesn't mean that you couldn't. So um, I'm not sure which tools would be the best one for that. Uh, we can look at SNCC and some others and see if we can come up with a compiled list to provide your way. It's definitely an important question. So. Yeah. With a chain of dependencies, you also need a chain of trust. And if you're installing dependencies and you don't necessarily know what dependencies those have, it's possible that you know a dependency may become uh, vulnerable. And in that case, um, you really want to be following, for example, a database of you know new announcements of vulnerable dependencies and be able to quickly and efficiently you know 
keep that code out of production or you know push an update pretty quickly. Well, sometimes that code's in production though too. Yeah. Right? And so you need to do vulnerability testing against um, code that already is in production even. Right? Exactly. Yep. Um, and there are some tools out there that do that. Um, AWS Inspector can actually do that and look for vulnerabilities that, that are known against your current fleet. It can run every week. It can run every couple of hours, I believe. Um, but And that can give you a list of vulnerabilities. And then, again, find those vulnerabilities, make the changes in the code, push it through CI, CD, and have it replace those, That's right. those things in production. So we uh, jumping back to my screen here, we've got uh, our test stage, and it looks like it succeeded. It so I, I fixed that vulnerability. I didn't have any problems. And we've gone on. So what's the next step is deploy. In this case, I'm just taking that Python code, and I'm pushing it to an S3 bucket. Um, there's a lot of different deploy targets we could have, though, and we'll walk through some of those later on. Yep, there absolutely are. Um, so good stuff there. So we have another demo. We do. That's a, it's a lengthy demo. It is. Um, we're going to try to talk through it. Um, and the idea with the demos is that we're, we're trying to show you as many demos as possible today because pipelines are as complex as you make them. They're as simple as you make them. But they, have, they can be very complex and do a bunch of different things. They can integrate with things like our, even code pipeline can integrate with Jenkins, for, per se. That's right. You could integrate in code pipeline with Jenkins. You could even have Jenkins make calls out to a service like uh, Inspector. That's right. <clears throat> uh, and you can do Lambda calls to do. You could do code, be code build to do testing. You could even do a Lambda call to do testing if you wanted to. Yeah. Um, so we have, a, we have a demo that we're going to go through. Yep. And it's a different flavor of something that we saw earlier, which is taking infrastructure as code, a CloudFormation stack, and sending it through. Um, we saw that earlier on the solutions post that we put out there. This is just a different flavor of what we're going to go through. A couple of different ways to do some testing and then show you what the end result is. That's right. And in this case, uh, we're going to show it as a video. That way we can compress time and we don't have to sit and watch for things to deploy. Yeah, pipelines can take quite a while to run. So, And here we go. We're off to the races. All right. So first and foremost, this particular one, uh, this pipeline has two source code repositories leading into it. So here's what's going to happen. You're going to commit your code, which is going to be uh, CloudFormation code. And when we take the CloudFormation code, CodeBuild is going to actually take it, and it's going to take the template, the CloudFormation template, and it's going to actually put it into an environment, and it's going to run the stack creating the CloudFormation code. That's right. And the, it'll create the environment. Uh, once the environment is created, it's actually going to validate that stack and look for a couple of different things. Okay. Um, it's going to look to make sure, where are we at right here? It's going to look to make sure uh, through the stack that it has things like the proper IAM roles were created. It's also going to look to ensure that ELBs were created, and it's also going to look to make sure that security groups were created. These yeah. are all. So this is a, a Python code in a Lambda function that's actually looking at the resources after they're deployed in, in your environment, and just confirming that all the resources are set up for compliance. Yep. Then we're going to come up. Oh, of course that. So then what's going to happen is um, we're going to run a Lambda function that's going to call AWS Cloud Config. Um, config is a way to look at resources once they're done and check and validate a few things as well. So here you can see that the Lambda code is going to go through. It's going to call Lam It's going to call AWS Config, mm -hmm. and then it's going to do some decision logic to determine whether or not it has things like proper tagging. Um, do certain resources require tags? Why would you might have tags on a resource for compliance reasons? Well. I might want to make sure that every resource is tagged with a proper cost center. I might want to make sure that data classification for S3 objects is tagged appropriately, right, or maybe yeah. EBS volumes. I've never used tags. We'll get you there. Don't worry. We're, we're a team. Thank you. Thank you. We're a team. Yeah, so config is really cool because it can uh, look at the resources in your environment, and it can let you know if uh, they meet compliance or they don't meet compliance. In this case, this Lambda function is actually kicking off the config evaluation and it's going to get the results back from config and then report those results back to the pipeline. It is, yep. Just another way that you can use a stage in the pipeline to call something outside of what you would usually see in the pipeline. Yep, and the way this works is that uh, once config is done running and we get some results, um, we're going to do some logic on those results, and then there's just an API call that Lambda makes to code pipeline. And once code pipeline gets that API response, it's going to move on to the next stage. Then and it this, gets interesting. Yeah. So let's say you have a Jenkins server that's already out there because you've been using it. So here what's going to happen is we're going to configure code pipeline to call a script um, over, in, over in Jenkins land. And when the script calls, it's actually going to op run in Jenkins, but mm -hmm. it's actually going to make an API call, like you said earlier, back to AWS Inspector. 
Yeah, it's really cool showing how you can integrate in these different services. So you can work in whatever tool you want. If you're comfortable doing this in Lambda and Python, you can do it. If you're comfortable working in Jenkins with your language of choice, you go for it. Yep. So here it's gonna it's gonna run. It's gonna wait for Inspector to run. Inspector's gonna look at depending on what you've configured it to look at: CIS benchmarks, security, best practices, and a few other things. <clears throat> it's gonna take the findings that it gets. It's gonna actually put them in an XML doc and send them back to something that Jenkins can display on the report page. Yep. And so Jenkins, this is what the configuration is <coughs> going to look like that gets set up inside of Jenkins. And some cool stuff's going on here. Jenkins is actually going to um, look at that inspection report. It's going to um, call, well, this is where it's calling it, in the build process. And the post-build option is really cool. So Jenkins has uh, plugins, so it can actually take that report and send it back to code pipeline as uh, an artifact. That's where the magic occurs. So it sends back the results back to the code pipeline, and then code pipeline can make sure what it sees in terms of a pass or fail in, in, in the pipeline. Assuming everything works, you're good. But in this case, oops. we have an oops scenario. Here in this, you, what you'll see is um, the first thing that we're going to highlight here is that um, is this the SSH oh, part? Yeah, look at that. Oh. Yeah. So, so somebody. Somebody <coughs> enabled password authentication for SSH. Instead of using a PEM key. Yeah. So that's that's not great. That's one ha that's one thing that we know exists in here. The other thing here you can see where the these where the, everything is commented out. Did somebody comment out tags? For some reason they decided against the standard not to include the tags of the resource. And then probably one of the uh, definitely a really bad one, um, you encrypt you encrypt in rest and you encrypt in transit in here. Uh, we did not have it encrypted at rest. So we went ahead and fixed that. We said use an EBS volume that's encrypted. We're doing a commit. They even ran a diff so you can see. Um, they do a commit, they do a push, and of course what happens, the pipeline kicks back off again. As the pipeline kicks back off, it's gonna see that, that the uh, source code has changed. It's gonna move right back down to the validate stage where it's gonna go through all the different things. It's gonna put the source code back out into... Yep, yep. So Jumping through here, it's deploying the whole CloudFormation stack now. Then it's going to run the Lambda function that's going to uh, validate it. Then it's going to run the other Lambda function that's going to kick off config. Then it's going to jump into Inspector. So oh, in, the, in this case, again. we see that we failed at the config compliance check. right? And the things config is looking for are these tags, which are missing. Yeah, you so, must have wrote that code too. Oh, I no comment. It. <laughs> it failed again. So Good thing I didn't tag it. <laughs> Where's the stoplight? Stoplight would be cool in here. All right, and we're gonna go through and encrypt our EBS volume now. Yes. All right, so theoretically, now if everything is good, mm -hmm. the compliance checks from AWS config should pass through flying colors. That's right. Right, because we have all the resources tagged appropriately. The encryption of the uh, boot volume or the uh, EBS volume now should also pass. Right. That's a good and thing. It looks like we are in the create stage. So the CloudFormation stack is standing up. It'll take a few minutes. In our case, just a few seconds since this is a video. And with the magic of Hollywood, we've cool. moved forward. And now we're kicking off Jenkins to go call Inspector. Um, so Jenkins is standing oh. It failed. So what is oh, Inspector doing? Things. Well, I didn't. You were. Yeah, so the... Inspector is running an agent on EC2 instances. And that agent is able to check for common CVEs, it's able to... CIS benchmarks as well as security best practices from our documentation. Right. So in this case, it looks like we failed a best practices. And our best practice was that there was not... Uh, Pem keys on the, SS yeah, on the SSH. Yeah, passwords. Yeah. Let's so, fix that. Simple fix again. And what's, what's important here, so let's, let's talk about what's happening now. We're like, okay, that's great. Let's fix it. The, the developer didn't realize that you shouldn't do that. No big deal. We've, we've done pen keys now. SSH is good. Right. We go back. We push. We commit. We push. The pipeline kicks off. And so what's something that's going to happen, it's going to get blip through kind of quick. But once it gets through the test stage, it actually, one of the final steps is delete the stack. Um, and but we just deploy while we're on delete. So the testing of that entire stack just yeah. says, is it good enough to move to the next environment? Right. So, if so, I, so that testing was in a... Test environment. Test environment. And, cool. this, and that could be in a totally different test account even. Oh, awesome. OK, cool. So once it's done, it'll actually delete the old stack. Look at that. It's just deleted, and it's jumping through it the It created actual... a change set, that and now it. we're at a manual approval. Should we approve this? I don't see why not. All right. So at this stage, you could have like your QA team go through and actually do manual checks on your code before it actually gets running in production. 
And in this case, we actually have a second production approval step that can be manual. So you can do that integration of automated and manual uh, steps all throughout your code pipeline. Yeah, exactly. They, they can, and so it also sends an email as well, which you can approve through the email. Right. Um, and that's, it's up to you whether or not you want to do manual approvals. You might do fully automated all the way through to UAP and then just do a manual approval from UAP to prod. It depends on what it is that your policies are. Yeah, and, and hey, it looks like we got another question. Another question. Yeah, so this one's from Mohib Wasai. Hey guys, awesome tutorial. Can I use code commit to deploy my static React.js apps on CloudFront? And are there best practices for that? Yeah, you should definitely be able to deploy. So you would be deploying to an S3 bucket, and then you'd be configuring CloudFront in front of that S3 bucket. Um, you could do that setup and configuration if you don't already have CloudFront set up, for example. You could use a CloudFormation template that deploys that. I'm not sure if we have a guide that necessarily goes through those specifics. For React specifically, but... But yeah, yeah it's going to be similar for anything where you have you know, just static web application. Um, so we'll, we'll look for something and we'll, we'll link it to you in the show notes either later today or uh, through next week. Yep. Cool. Yeah. All right. So that explains how we do CI CD all the way through through product production. Um, how do I create a CI CD? Yeah, let's, so how, let's talk about that a little bit for someone who wants to get started. Let's jump into how you actually create one of these pipelines, right? So we'll go to the AWS Management Console. We'll go to Code Pipeline as the service and create a new pipeline. Give it a name, Eric's cool pipeline. It, it's probably taken. Oh yeah? I'm thinking. You already have a cool pipeline, huh? Many of them. Okay, cool. So what is this artifact store? So what's that telling me? It looks like it says I can either, it's gonna pick a, its own S3 bucket or it's gonna let me use my own? Yep, yeah, that's right. So um, later steps in your code pipeline process, um, you're gonna wanna make sure that those steps can access your artifacts. So, you will either give them IAM permissions to access the default bucket, or if you have your own custom bucket, you're just gonna need to make sure you configure your IAM roles that way. I'll go with the default right now. And here's where we can pick our source. So I was talking about how we can use code commit, which is awesome. Yep. We can also use ECR, and that is? That's our elastic container registry, which is where if you were doing um, Docker files, you'd be putting your Docker files or, uh, up, up to ECR. That's right, yeah. You can store Docker images in ECR, which yep. is super awesome. You can use new Docker images to kick off a pipeline, which is great. You can also just uh, push code to Amazon S3. So if you have uh, some other solution, um, you can just uh, you know make the connector that writes that code to S3, mm -hmm. or you can even do, just develop locally and then do an S3 upload, for example. And finally, we talked about GitHub. Um, I'll show you really quickly. The GitHub connection is really cool. We use OAuth to connect to GitHub, and then we can use GitHub webhooks. So anytime you make a commit, commit that uh, webhook will send an event back to code pipeline, and within seconds, we can uh, start processing the pipeline. Um, in this case, I'll just select code commit and we'll jump on to a few of the other steps. So with code commit, I'll click my repository and then uh, any of our branches in that repository. And Help me understand, why would I, I see master, what, what, it, what other branches would be there and why? Yeah, so typically when you've got um, a whole bunch of engineers working on or developers working on a project, everyone's going to work in a different feature branch. So you've got different people working on different parts of the application. They're only working their own separate branches, and in those branches, they'll do small little features, and then they'll push those branches once they've been uh, completed and make a push into the master. So this is really cool. You can have multiple pipelines all coming from the same uh, repo yep. um, for the different features. In this case, we only have a master branch. It's very simple. And then we've got two different change detection options. Do you want to go through these? Uh, the different change options. Yeah. So we've got a CloudWatch event, and then we've got code pipeline itself. Yeah, so uh, CloudWatch event just means when you commit the code, that it'll actually create a CloudWatch event that is back to near real time within seconds of the commit. Um, it'll trigger the pipeline to go ahead and kick off based on the changes made versus the other one, which is sporadically go at some period of time and, and go poll and see if there's a change already made. Yeah, yeah, so polling versus pushing essentially, which is pretty cool. Um, so once we've got a source, uh, we can uh, select a build tool. In this case, we can select code build or we can select Jenkins. And this uh, is where we saw in the Jenkins part, this is where we saw that in, in the earlier demo, the recorded demo, that there was a call to Jenkins that ran a script that called AWS Inspector. And exactly. Back. Yeah, and we already walked through code build. Remember, that will um, deploy a managed container that 
Um, we'll go through any build steps you have to do any compilation or any... And test steps as well. Yeah, any compilation or testing or yep. anything else you just need to run in a container environment before your code is ready to put into production. Um, so you can also skip the build stage. For example, if you're doing a web application and you don't have a build process, you can just skip that, go right from sourcing to deployment or just sourcing to testing. So I'll go ahead and skip the build on this one. And deployment, this is really cool. We've got lots of different services you can deploy to. So we talked about um, deploying to S3. You can also deploy CloudFormation templates directly into CloudFormation. You can deploy out to code deploy, Beanstalk environments, Office work stacks, a whole bunch of things. Alexa skills kits you can even deploy. Have you had the ability to write a skill set yet? With the I opportunity have. To? Yeah, I've written a Lexus skill before. I've written a couple. Have you? Yeah, one of the coolest ones I wrote was when my toddler was still a baby and he was going to daycare. Um, they had a, a, an Android application I could use to go see what his day was like. But sometimes I, I get home and I've got him in my arms and my phone's in my back pocket and he's crying <laughs> and I don't know when the last time he was fed, I don't know when his last diaper change was. And I realized all that data is available in the Android application. So I. Uh, was able to use the API that the app uses and uh, wrote some Python code around that to go query that API using my credentials, get the response back, and I just get home and I say, hey, Alexa, open daycare. And she'll tell me, hey, Mikey's last diaper was uh, 10 minutes ago. So I'm like, okay, good. That's and good. his last Check. bottle was two hours ago. He's probably hungry. <laughs> it's brilliant. That's pretty good. Yeah, and, and since then, actually, the Alexa Skills Kit has a whole health API, and they have, um, they have like, reports just for that, like, you know, diaper reports. So it's really cool. There's a lot of thought around that. I wasn't crazy when I made it. No, you did well. You I was well. crazy having it. Yeah, How about you? Have you written any skills? Uh, I've done I've done a couple. Uh, my favorite, uh, which is far more complex than anything you've clearly done. Obviously. Yeah. Um, it calculates uh, my fa any, any member of my family's birthday upon asking. Oh, excellent. Um, my But uh, everyone's name and birthday is accurate with exception of, of my wife, to ensure that she, I don't think she's gonna break 30. There's a, there's a never gonna break upper 30. threshold on yeah, that Yeah, never gonna break 30. Yeah, that never. makes sense. Yeah. Really cool. Yeah, well, you know, that was that was complex code, so. It, it sounds like it, yeah. oh, awesome, cool, very cool. Um, you know, one of the other things that's in here real quick also is the ability to do blue-green. So what the CDI, CD pipelines now uh, have been and allow even to here allow you to do blue-green deployments in ECS as well as you can do it on instances as well which is I deploy code, it sets up a new set of servers or ECS containers for my application, keeping right. the original ones on as well, and then it actually does a bleed off and does a cut over as long as the instance or the container health is good. Um, that way you can actually do blue-green without taking an outage on deployment. Yeah, that, that's a really cool feature. And you can even bring that from EC2 containers. You actually bring that into serverless with Lambda. So uh, if you want, go look in code deploy and you can do code deployments to Lambda where you can say, you know, continue serving traffic on the current version of my Lambda function, and over an hour phase into this new version. Yeah. And then you can also have rollbacks based on error rates. So for example, you know, if you've got a problem with this new version, you didn't catch it right away, it's only affecting some percent, we can actually immediately cancel that deployment, go back to the old version, we can figure out what was wrong, and then redeploy at a later time. Yeah. So let's do a little bit of recap about what we, what we talked about today. Um, we're talking about building secure apps. This is, again, episode four. And we're talking about how do we do DevSecOps uh, through CI/CD. That's right. So we talked about moving test cases for uh, static code analysis uh, and vulnerabilities into a testing part of your CI/CD platform. Right. Um, everything comes out of a repo. Mm -hmm. um, builds can be uh, they're automated, and deployments are also automated. That's so right. The the days of manual testing these uh, are gone. Yeah, and we showed just a simple static analysis. Again, you can get a lot more complicated in your pipelines. You can actually, you know, deploy in your uh, test environment, and then do full dynamic analysis with any open source or commercial tools. Um, again, there's whole companies that have, you know, uh, business cases built around these sort of tests. So you can look at different tests that make sense for your needs and yes. build your pipeline appropriately. And next week, they're talking about uh, AWS deep dive on compliance. That's right. Yeah, that sounds really cool. What is compliance? So well, it depends on which area you're talking about. It could be like a, it could be a, a, a compliance like NIST 800.53 compliance. Okay. Uh, it could be down to compliance at the at the at the level of the um, organization. Again, I need to have data classification tags on things. So we'll have to see how deep they go. You have to come back next week to find out for sure. I will watch next week. Thank you. Um, let's go ahead and give a big thanks to our 
our lounge guys today. Yeah. Thank you, gentlemen. Right. Appreciate Happy it. To. Um, we'd also like any other topics you're interested in having covered, tell us in the chat. Be good information for us to have for the future. Perfect. Yeah, thanks for being here with us today. Um, we hope you've learned a little bit. I'm sure we're going to learn a whole lot from your feedback. Definitely reach out. Anything we haven't covered, anything we need to cover for you guys, or any other questions you have, we really enjoy doing this. Yep, and then the final thing is um, there is a blog post that follows this episode four. So it should be, the link should be in the chat. Go out, take a look at it. And again, we hope to see you guys next week. Thank you. Thanks.